Thank you so much for coming again. Oh, sure. Thank you very much for inviting me. So I can't really see what's on the screen. This is, uh, say, top 10 tips for brain out. Great. Okay. I'm in the right place. Um, thank you very much for coming out today. My name is Kevin Duff. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Neurology here at the University of Utah. I'm also a clinical neuropsychologist, and I work in the Center for Alzheimer's Care, Imaging, and Research that we have here at the university. Um, I spend about half my time doing patient evaluations. I'm trying to determine if folks have dementia. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And about half my time doing research on cognitive disorders in late life. So getting an opportunity to come here today to talk about a topic that's um, very near and dear to my heart um, is a real pleasure. So thank you for coming out. I really appreciate it. Um, I probably have about... 35 minutes of slides or so, so there should be time for questions at the end. I'm happy to answer questions until they kick us out of here. Um, and so, um, again, uh, what we're going to talk about um, over the next you know, half hour or so are um, the top 10 tips for brain health. And um, I will warn you, however, that I ended up with more than 10. So for those of you who only wanted 10, I'll let you know when 10's up and you can feel free to leave. Um, <laughs> These are in no particular order, so um, you know if you wait around for the last ones, that doesn't mean they're any better than the first ones. Um, but I did want to sort of set the stage a little bit for the problem that we're going to be talking about, why we need tips for brain health. And so um, one way to do that is um, with a little story. So there was an older couple. They were in their uh, 70s, and they um, had another couple over to their home for dinner. All right, if, if you've heard me talk before and you know the punchline, don't tell anybody, all right? So um, they have another couple, another older couple over to their home for dinner, and um, the two gentlemen are sitting in the living room after the meal, and their wives are in the kitchen getting coffee or dessert or something like that. And the one gentleman who lives at the home says to his friend, um, we went to this great restaurant last week. Um, you should really go. The food was fantastic. The prices were just great. The service was excellent. And the second gentleman says, oh, that sounds wonderful. Uh, what was the name of the restaurant? We'll definitely go. And the first gentleman sort of scratches his head and says, you know, I can't remember the name of the restaurant. And he thinks and he thinks and he says, oh, I know. What's the name of that flower? It's red. Uh, it has thorns on it. You give it on Valentine's Day. And his friend says, Rose? And the first gentleman turns to the kitchen and says, Rose, what was the name of that restaurant we went to last week? <laughs> I think most of us probably in the room can relate to that, that every once in a while we forget the name of a restaurant, hopefully not our name of our spouse or significant other, but some word just doesn't quite come to us and we start to wonder, you know, well, is this the sign of, you know, Alzheimer's disease developing? Is this the beginning of the end? And um, I think one thing to take away from it is forgetting a word here or there, as I will probably do a couple of times during my presentation, is not necessarily a sign of a problem. But um, let's uh, dive into this a little bit more. So again, setting the stage, uh, what is the problem that we're dealing with? Well, the problem in general is that aging, getting older, has some detrimental effects on the brain and the functions of the brain. Allow me to present just a little bit of evidence. So on this first slide, you'll notice um, one of the things that we know about the brain in normal, healthy people as they get older is the brain gets smaller. It tends to shrink, what we call atrophy. And what is represented up here on the slide, and maybe I can actually use this... Um, so along the bottom of the slide are decades of life, going from 10s and 20s all the way out to 80s and 90s. Along the side of the slide, we have the size of the brain, with numbers near the top being bigger, numbers near the bottom being smaller. And what this represents is one section of the brain, a section of the brain called the hippocampus, which is a structure in the brain that we know is related to memory our ability to lay down memories, in some way information passes through the hippocampus. And what this figure shows is this is for our uh, magnetic resonance imaging or MRI scans, sort of x-rays of the brain, in particular that hippocampal structure. 
And what it shows is that as we get older, that particular structure within the brain tends to get smaller. So people in their 20s and 30s tend to have larger hippocampal structures than people in their 80s and 90s. These are all normal, healthy individuals, not people with Alzheimer's disease or other types of cognitive problems, but a normal natural change for the brain as we get older is that it does tend to get smaller. And I could show slides like this for other structures in the brain. It's not just the hippocampus that gets smaller. Many different regions of the brain get smaller. So one thing to take away is that the brain does change as we get older, and in one way is it gets smaller. Another way that the brain tends to change as we get older is that it tends to be less active. So what I have up here are PET scans, or positron emission tomography scans, which are a different type of scan in the brain that shows the activity going on within the brain. Actually what it shows is the amount of glucose or sugar that's being processed in the brain at a certain time. The way to read these PET scans is that the hotter colors, the reds, the yellows, the oranges, indicate greater activity. The cooler colors, the blues and the greens, tend to indicate less activity. Now this represents going from left to right, um, again decades of life, from early in life out to later in life. And these are just three sections of an individual's brain scan. And what you'll notice is that as we get from younger to older, we see less hotter colors. That in the 20s and 30s, we see a lot of hot colors, but as we get out to the same parts of the brain in 70s and 80s, we see less hot colors. So that means that as we get older, the brain tends to be less active. Now this is just the brain at rest. This doesn't mean that somebody in their 80s and 90s can't activate their brain if they need to. If I were to give you a very complicated math problem, for example, we'd see all kind of activity within the brain. But at rest, younger people tend to have more active brains than older folks. And again, these are all normal, healthy individuals without sign of dementia or other types of cognitive difficulties. So the brain's smaller and it's less active. Another thing, or consequence perhaps, of a smaller and a less active brain is that we see changes in people's thinking abilities as they get older. Might be preaching to the choir a little bit, but um, you probably don't think as quickly now as you did when you are in your 20s and 30s. And this is uh, a figure that represents a large body of research that supports that. Again, along the bottom of the graph, um, I have decades of life, now from 30s and 40s all the way out to 80s and 90s. Along the side, I have scores on some type of thinking test, where higher scores indicate the person's doing better, lower scores indicate the person's doing a little bit worse. What I have is two different cognitive abilities represented on this figure. The first one, the blue line, that also has diamonds, uh, represents processing speed, or how quickly we take in information, do something with it, and then get it back out there. And what this shows is that in normal, healthy indi individuals, as we get older, our processing speed tends to slow down. That we don't think as quickly when we're older as we do when we're younger. Again, this doesn't mean that you can't think or that you can't do that arithmetic problem. It's just going to take longer to get to the answer. That's a normal change that we expect to see. A second change is represented by that red line with the squares, and this represents memory. You know, and hopefully memory the same way that you think about it. Your ability to remember a list of things that you wanted to get at the grocery store, your ability to remember where you parked your car when you went to the grocery store, um, you remember uh, the PIN number so that you can buy things at the grocery store, all that's memory. And what we know is that memory is one of those cognitive abilities that actually stays relatively stable throughout much of the lifespan, indicated by this relatively flat line in memory from 30s really going out pretty much to 70s. We don't expect to see dramatic changes in somebody's memory throughout most of their life. Now, past the age of 70, we do start to notice some slight changes in memory, but even for individuals out into their 90s, these scores are still largely within the normal range. So we don't expect to see dramatic changes in somebody's memory later on in life. Um, but we do see changes in people's memory later on in life. 
And what I want to do is ask for your opinion, um, your educated opinion now, about whether you think these are normal changes in somebody's thinking abilities or abnormal changes in somebody's thinking abilities later on in life. And just feel free to shout out your answer. So for example, making lists for a grocery store. Is that normal or abnormal? Normal. Normal, yeah. I think if you need to get more than about three or four things at the grocery store, making a list is a good idea, and it uh, probably makes sense, and that's a very normal thing that people experience. How about getting lost in a familiar place? Normal or abnormal? Abnormal, right. Getting lost in your own neighborhood, your own community, someplace you know well is definitely probably a sign that there's a problem developing. Um, Kathy, I think they know everything I have to say, so we might wrap up early. <laughs> well, we'll do a few more. Um, how about forgetting what you had for breakfast? Normal or abnormal? Uh, um, I take that back. We might need extra time. Um, so, I think... I, I, I guess I wasn't entirely clear on this. Um, it could be normal, abnormal, or it may depend. Um, I think this is an example where it may depend. Let's say that you're the kind of person that has the same bowl of cornflakes, the same glass of juice, the same piece of toast, 365 days a year, nothing special about this one. I ask you, what'd you have for breakfast? And you sort of draw a blank for a minute and you don't remember, but later you do. That's probably not a sign of a problem. There's nothing special about that breakfast that really stood out. But let's say today was a special day that you went to a special breakfast at a special restaurant with a special relative, maybe to celebrate their birthday. And then I ask you later today, what did you have for breakfast and you don't remember? I might be more concerned in that second case because it probably should have stood out a little bit more. So in some instances, it really may depend on the circumstances around it. All right, my bad. Um, how about forgetting to eat breakfast? Not because you're trying to lose weight, not because you're in such a hurry to leave in the morning, but because you plum forgot to eat, uh, eat the meal. Normal or abnormal? Yeah, in fact, for patients that live alone, one of the first signs that we start to pick up that there may be a significant problem is they start losing weight. And one of the reasons is they're either forgetting or unable to prepare meals for themselves. So that really can be a sign of a problem starting to develop. Um, Trouble thinking of the word that you want to use. Normal or abnormal? I, I had a lot of, oh, let it be normal. Um, yes, um, definitely normal. I think, you know, forgetting a word um, is something that's not the name of your spouse, but um, how about walking in a room and forgetting why? You're trying to convince me it's normal, is that it? Fortunately for you all, that didn't happen to me today. I remember why I came into this room. Um, but yes, I think we all have that instance. Um, it seems like it happens mostly when we walk down a flight of stairs, like into the basement. Somehow we forget where it, we came down for, but then walking back up the flight of stairs gets blood to our brain or something. We remember why. We have to go back down. Um, but yeah, very normal occurrence. Um, misplacing glasses or other common everyday items like keys or your wallet. Normal, yeah. Um, However, from working with patients, I'd recommend three places to look for your glasses before you actually figure out they're lost. Yeah, one is on top of your head, uh, two is on a chain around your neck, and three, you may actually be looking through them and need a new prescription. Not one of those three places, it's time to get them a place. Um, how about this one? Repeating yourself within a conversation, normal or abnormal? So now let's say that you know, you're not trying to emphasize a point, you think the person's been listening to you and you're repeating yourself within the same conversation. Then we do start to get more concerned about that. In fact, one of the things that I start to judge is the less time that passes between when somebody first tells me something and repeats it, the more I get concerned about it. For example, if you tell me this amusing story and then 15 minutes later you tell me the same amusing story not realizing you just told it to me, I'd be more concerned. But if you catch me today and then see me later this week and tell me the same story again, I'm less concerned. Um, forgetting where you parked your car? Yeah, I mean, again, it probably depends. You know, if it's, you know, Christmas time and you're at the big box store and, you know, there's rows A through double Z and you don't temporarily remember. Um, what we really think happens with people that forget where they parked their car is they're really not paying attention to the landmarks of when they parked it. So it's probably more of an attention thing than memory. 
Um, how about not recognizing family members, normal or abnormal? Right, yeah, definitely when you're not recognizing people that are close to you, whether they're family, close friends, uh, neighbors, uh, definitely a sign of a problem. How about this last one, forgetting a pot on the stove because you forgot about it, normal or abnormal? Yeah, pro it, it really could depend. I think we probably all had the instance where we put a pot on the stove, the phone rang, or we got engrossed in a newspaper article or television program, we forgot about it, it burned over. But if this starts to happen with any regularity, more than once or twice, we often start to become concerned about that as a problem because it really can be a safety concern. So one thing to take away from this slide is that there are some examples of memory problems that are clearly uh, a sign of abnormality. Some that are probably very normal that happen to all of us, but a lot that sort of fall in a gray area where it really depends. We talked about the problem. Now what I'd like to spend the rest of the time is talking about some solutions, some things that you can do in your day-to-day -day life to improve your brain health, improve your brain fitness, try to prevent some of those things that we have talked about problem-wise from even happening in the first place. And again, as a warning, there are actually more than 10. Number one, take a hike. No, not, not right now, not literally. But um, we do know that physical exercise is something that's good for brain health. Okay, here's just one example. This was a study that looked at 120 people um, age 65 and older, all who at the beginning of the study did not have dementia, did not have significant cognitive difficulties that interfere with their day-to-day -day life. And these individuals were randomly assigned to one of two groups. In one group, they engaged in aerobic exercise for 40 minutes a day. And the aerobic exercise was just walking. So it's not anything heavy duty, not anything too demanding, but walking for 40 minutes every day. The second group was assigned to a non-aerobic activity. In this particular case, stretching. All right, so now you can see that, that they were divided up into two groups, either an aerobic activity of walking 40 minutes a day or um, a non-aerobic activity of stretching for about the same amount of time each day. And they were enrolled in this study for a year. And what they did was a number of different tests on everybody at the beginning, at six months, and at the end of a year. But one of the, um, one of the measures that they were looking at was the size of the hippocampus. Remember that structure I had told you about where um, it's involved in memory. And what they showed was the blue line uh, up there, that's right, represents those people that were in the aerobic activity. And what you'll notice is that across the year of the study, their hippocampus actually got larger. It actually got 2% larger. Now, 2% might not sound like a lot, but when it comes to the hippocampus over a year, 2% is actually a lot. Because on the flip side, those um, individuals that were in the stretching activity, represented by the red bar up there, their hippocampus actually shrunk across the year by about 1.5%. So, by engaging in physical activity, it actually increased um, the size of the hippocampus and offset what we would probably call normal aging over one year. So, physical activity, whether it's walking, taking a hike, or doing some other thing, is good for the brain and good for your uh, cognitive health in the long run. Um, that's a great question. So if they're randomly assigned, why are there baseline differences? Because random assignment doesn't always work out. That um, sometimes we see that one group is slightly different than the other at baseline. But that was controlled for in these analyses. And also the fact that they went in opposite directions helps. But that's a very astute point. Right, it was daily. So, but there's other studies to say that, um, you know, three or more times a week is probably the key um, variable. I'm sorry, we don't That's have time for questions. Oh, and, oh, well, but we do because this isn't moving. It's, the slides aren't advancing. Okay, so I'm going to make it move. No, um, I can actually, um, just without visual, um, tell you about the next okay. uh, tip. Right, so um, they do it with an MRI scan, like those x-rays that I showed you before. Um, they either with computers or hand tracing, once they get the MRI scan, they can identify where that structure is and uh, track it. You should be good to go now. Oh, great, okay, thank you.
So, um, so the first one is uh, take, a, take a hike or engage in physical exercise. The second is flex your mental muscle. So I want to tell you about one study um, that I think is particularly telling about this. It was called the ACTIVE trial. And ACTIVE in this case stood for Advanced Cognitive Training for Independent and Vital Elders. I think it's a great title. But it was the largest trial ever done to date that specifically looked at trying to improve thinking abilities or cognition in older adults. It recruited almost 3,000 community-dwelling seniors, people aged 65 to 94. And it divided those people up into one of three groups, where they got training specifically in memory, or reasoning skills, or uh, processing speed, how quickly they could think. Each group received 10 training sessions in their particular area. Yay, thank you. And here are the results. So, um, first of all, uh, along the, um, this study actually was also one of the longest running studies ever. So you'll notice that um, the time course on the bottom goes from the beginning baseline all the way to 10 years they followed these subjects. And along the left side of the figure is the percent improvement that we see in, cognitive, in those particular cognitive abilities divided out by the three groups. So the first line I want to draw your attention to is the dashed line uh, with the green, and that is the people that were in the memory training group. And what you'll notice is that from baseline to their first immediate follow-up, they improved their memory scores by about 10%. And then they uh, maintain those memory scores and continue to improve them through three years. And then they did start to show some decline through year five and into year 10. But by the end of the year of the study, 10 years later, they were almost at the same point that they started, which is not a normal natural change. We expect people to decline across time. So they essentially improved and then leveled off to where they were at the very beginning of the study, which was really a big success, I think, for memory training. But the training in the other two groups was even more uh, critical or, or exciting. Yeah. Uh. Oh, they stopped doing the task um, right after the post-testing. So this was uh, 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 training that lasted for this period of time. So the other two groups, um, showed similar types of effects, reasoning and processing speed. You'll notice that they showed incredible improvements um, from baseline to immediately after the training, improving by 30 and 40 percent over their baseline scores. And then, even though there were some dips up and down, they stayed relatively stable, again, through about five years into the study. For that last period of time, from five to 10 years, they did start to drop off. But even 10 years out, they were significantly better than they were at the beginning of the trial. This is one of the first biggest and best trials that shows that flexing your mental muscle can actually have long-lasting effects. And they also looked at not just cognitive scores, but how this plays out in day-to-day -day life and showed that some of these cognitive abilities transferred in the person being able to be uh, more independent for a longer period of time. Uh, the third thing we recommend is get social. And I know that coming here today is a perfect example of that, or participating in some of the OSHA programs is a way to do that. But here's a study that sort of also demonstrates it. So this was a study that actually looked at 11,000 people, age 50 and older, all people living out in the community. And at the beginning of the trial, it gave everybody a memory test, and then it repeated that test a number of times over the next six years. Also at the beginning of the trial, it asked people, what types of social activities do you do? For example, are you married, or do you have a significant social relationship? Do you do volunteer work? Are you regularly engaged with neighbors, family, friends, things like that? And it broke people up into two groups. The solid line up there represents people that were highly socially active, highly socially engaged, highly socially integrated. The dashed line on the bottom represents those people that were less socially engaged, less socially active, less socially integrated. You'll notice that for both groups across time, their memory scores actually do decline, and we know that that does happen. But by the end of the study, those people that were more social at the beginning had better memory scores. 
So by engaging in social activity, and there's many other studies that support this, we think that we can improve our brain health and at the very least our memory scores. So make sure that you interact with other people. Um, to the degree that you can, go back to school. And, um, well, for example, you could sign up for classes from OSHA. Really, they don't pay me to do this stuff. This is the evidence saying this. But what this shows is that um, your risk of developing dementia, let's say that we set your risk for people that had um, high school education or greater. Okay, that was a level risk of developing dementia. If you had less years of education, for example, um, 8 to 11 years of education, your risk would increase by about 49%, that red bar going up. If you had even less than 8 years of education, your risk of developing dementia almost doubles. Uh, the, blue, the dark blue bar um, up at 2. So less education that you have puts us at greater risk for developing dementia. More education seems to reduce our risk of dementia. However, there's a caveat to this that I have in that red box. Surprisingly, once people get diagnosed with dementia, higher levels of education are associated with quicker progression. That once we actually say, yes, you have Alzheimer's disease, it's probably going to progress more quickly if you have 16 years of education than if you have 12 years of education. We're not exactly quite sure why that happens, but it, it is sort of one of the realities of it. Nonetheless, in preventing dementia in the first place, more education is better. Dance. Again, not necessarily right now unless the mood strikes you. But there is a number of studies, including this one, that uh, looked at older adults um, who were amateur dancers, not professionals, but you know, were involved in a club where maybe they danced on a weekly basis, and they compared them to people with no dancing history. And they compared them on a number of different variables, but the very first one, uh, the first two gray bars right here, um, represent cognition or thinking abilities. The light gray bar rep represents the amateur dancers, and the dark gray bar represents the uh, control group that had no dancing experience. And you'll notice that those people that danced had better thinking abilities than those people that didn't dance. They also had faster reaction times. They also had better posture and balance. They had general better motor performance. And they also had better sensory performances in their hands. So dancing not only benefits cognition, but a number of other uh, uh, indicators of good physical health. Um, the next one. If you can, get some new genes. No, not those genes. Um, this is just because people often ask about kind of heredity and dementia and risk. And so I just wanted to throw a slide in here. Not that we're doing that yet, um, but maybe you know, in 10 years or so. Um, if you are um, in the general population and you have no family member that had Alzheimer's disease or some other type of dementia, your risk of developing dementia after the age of 65 is probably about 1% to 2%, okay? If you have a family member who developed Alzheimer's disease after the age of 65, what we call late onset Alzheimer's disease, your risk of developing dementia is probably about 2%, slightly on the higher side of the general population. However, if you had a family member who developed Alzheimer's disease before the age of 65, what we typically call early onset Alzheimer's disease, then your risk of developing dementia is about 7%. Now, 7% still seems low, but when you compare it to the general population, it's quite a bit higher. I will say, however, that early onset Alzheimer's disease is quite rare. Probably only about 10% of all cases of Alzheimer's disease are early onset. The vast majority of them are late onset, so odds are, if you have family members, they're probably more of the late onset variety. But nonetheless, it, it is a risk factor that we need to be aware of. Um, the next tip, wear a helmet. Um, not necessarily all the time, but when you're at risk of uh, head injury, because although um, studies are somewhat equivocal in their findings, the vast majority of them seem to suggest that if you get a head injury during your life, it may put you at greater risk for developing a wide range of neurodegenerative diseases, including dementia and Alzheimer's disease later on in life. 
Now, it does seem that the later in life that you have the head injury, the greater risk you're at. So protecting your heads now is even more important. So you don't have to fret about that time where you fell out of the apple tree when you were you know, six. That probably doesn't really increase your risk that much. But a fall now on ice where you significantly hurt your head, that probably puts you at greater risk for that. So protect that head. Um, the next one, good advice for anything, but be happy. So, again, looking at the relative risk of developing dementia. This was a study that looked at almost 300,000 veterans, age 55 and older, all who did not have dementia at the beginning of the study. And what it did was, at the beginning of the study, it looked at um, how they rate their mood, whether they see themselves as happy or depressed. And then it followed them across seven years to see which ones went on to develop dementia and which ones didn't. So those people that said, I'm fine, I have no worries, I, my mood is good, I'm not depressed, they had the standard, they're represented by the red bar, they had the standard risk of developing dementia, that 1 to 2%. However, those people that reported either minor or major depression at baseline, represented by the light blue and the dark blue line up there, had almost double or more than double the risk of developing dementia across seven years. So the more that you can keep your mood on the positive side, you decrease your risk of developing dementia later on in life. Um, the next one, lose that spare tire. No, not the one at the top, the one at the bottom. Obesity is a significant risk factor for developing dementia later on in life. Even obesity in middle age. So if you think, well, I'm not at risk for dementia because I'm young and I can have lots of time before I burn off these calories or extra pounds, no, you want to start early. We think that the risk is probably really put down in mid-age, uh, mid uh, midlife, and it only catches up with us later on in life. So the more that we can keep to a healthy weight, whatever that is, um, that you and your doctors decide upon, um, probably reduces your risk of developing dementia later on in life. Um, let's see. Oh, um, visit your doctor. So like... Um, the slide just before this. Um, obesity is just one of many chronic medical conditions that probably put us at significant risk for developing dementia. The more that we work with our primary care doctors and other specialists involved in our health care, the more that we manage those risk factors, the more that we probably reduce our risk of developing dementia later on in life. Just for example, a couple meta-analyses where they looked at a large number of studies of patients with high blood pressure showed that patients that fall outside of the normal range of blood pressure are anywhere from two to four times more likely to develop dementia. And prescribing um, medications to get your blood pressure back into the normal range seems to reduce that risk. So working with your doctor to keep your blood pressure in a normal range probably puts you in a better place. Similarly, if you have diabetes, even um, type 2 adult onset diabetes, it's associated with a one and a half to two and a half times greater risk of developing dementia later on in life. So these are just two examples, but the more, again, that you can keep these conditions in check by working with your doctor, um, the better you are in the long run. Uh, the next tip that we have for people, get a hobby. Um, and the reason that we say that is because people that engage in hobbies, especially on a regular basis, seem to be at lower risk for developing dementia, especially the longer they engage in that hobby. For example, up on this graph, um, along the bottom, uh, uh, this is uh, years that people were involved in a study. The study started and then they followed them up after two years, four years, and six years. Along the left side shows the relative risk that the person has of developing dementia during the course of this study. The green line represents sort of the baseline condition. People that engage in hobbies from not at all to up to three hours per week. So their risk was again, standard set at one. However, those people that reported engaging in hobbies more frequently during a week for example, the blue dashed line represents those people that engaged in hobbies for four to six hours a week. By the end of the study, they had reduced their risk of developing dementia by 20%. Those people that engage in six hours or more of a hobby on a regular basis per week, 
even more significantly reduce that risk. From the very beginning of the study, almost, they were at less risk of developing dementia. They had cut their risk by almost 60%, and that maintained throughout the study. So um, as I note there in the bottom, the take-home message is six hours or more per week of a hobby can reduce your risk of developing dementia from anywhere from 50 to 60%, which is really significant for something that hopefully you like to do anyway. I think the problem is, is that sometimes we get busy, and even though these are things that we enjoy, we don't carve out time for them. The more that we do carve out time for them, it's probably going to help us in a number of different ways, including our thinking abilities and brain health. Um, my next tip um, is uh, beware of snake oil. I think most of you know what snake oil is, but in this particular case, if you stay up late and watch cable TV, or you're on the internet Googling brain health, or you look in the back of health food magazines, odds are you are going to see an ad for a box of pills, and usually they're about $19.95 per bottle, unless you order right now, then they'll send you two bottles for that same price. There's probably about 60 in there, and they probably, and they swear that those pills are going to help your brain health. Well, I've looked at just about every one that I've come across as what's the real evidence to say that they help. Most of them have a few animal studies where they test these compounds in large quantities in rats and mice and show some small effect in running mazes, but hardly any of them have any evidence in humans to say that they really do help with either thinking abilities or in changing our brain structure. So, you can buy these things, they're probably not harmful for you, but truthfully it's probably a waste of your money, and you could probably put that money and resources into something that's going to be much more effective. So, um, you know, I apologize if anybody here has stock in any of these uh, companies, but um, that's just sort of what the evidence shows. If any of these really worked, we'd be giving them out at the university. You know, there'd be large-scale studies and the ones that have looked at them have not found that when we really look closely, um, they do anything. Um, so, you know, my next tip um, is to eat well. Um, proper, nutrish, uh, proper nutrition really seems to be key for brain health. Um, a lot of you have probably heard about kind of like a heart-healthy diet. Um, you know, maybe one that's low in fats, um, tries to keep our cholesterol um, in a reasonable range, uh, low fats, um, uh, better uh, protein options, more fruits and vegetables, whole grains, reduced salt, all that stuff. That's good for your heart. There is no really approved brain healthy diet, but people who have looked at the heart healthy diet has, have shown that it, te it seems to have benefits on cognition in the long run. So a heart healthy diet is not only good for the heart, but probably also good for the brain and our thinking abilities as well. Yes? Right, yeah, so sugar is tricky because, you know, there's obviously, like with a lot of these other things, there's, you know, good sugars, natural sugars that we get from fruits and vegetables and lots of fruits. Those obviously are important for brain health. Then there's lots of processed sugars that are probably less so. People have not looked as closely at that, but because I think that's becoming a more popular diet trend, I think we will start to see that more. Unfortunately, I remember being at a conference a few years ago where I did see a study that was sponsored by Hershey that did, <laughs> that did not find the benefit of eating chocolate for brain health. But I don't think, I think the uh, jury's still out on that one. I'm still doing my own personal studies. Um, next one, stop smoking. The risk of dementia between somebody who never smoked and a current smoker is about uh, 50 to 150% higher. So if you're a smoker, you significantly increase your risk of developing dementia, probably because of a lot of other factors too, but we know that um, reducing risk, uh, smoking, uh, stopping smoking definitely uh, puts people at risk. All right, um, drink, um, again, not right now, but not too much. If we said the risk of people um, who drank no alcohol at all was set at one, there is a number of studies that show that people that uh, drink lightly to moderately, which is one to three drinks per day, um, reduce their risk by about 30%. Now that is... Um, <laughs> now, that goes in the opposite direction too. For people that drink heavy, more than three drinks per day, the risk goes back up. 
And so it's, it's like a lot of other things, like with eating, like with exercise, like with everything. It's really moderation that seems to be the key. It should be noted, however, that this study was also sponsored by some French wine company. <laughs> and that's true. But it doesn't necessarily take away the fighting, and there's other studies that support that too. Um, the next one, steal your grandson's Nintendo. Video games, surprisingly, seem to be able to speed up some of our thinking abilities. This is one study, and we're running a similar one to this at the university right now, that when we give one group of people a video game that engages them, that forces them to uh, process information quickly, we give another group a control task, those people that got the fast-acting video game significantly can improve their processing speed and memory over a relatively short period of time. Um, I'm hurrying because I'm running out of time. Get some rest. Um, sleep deprivation. Routinely getting less than seven or eight hours per night can lead to significantly poor concentration and memory. It also has a whole host of other poor problems. Leads to increased stress, worse physical health, poor interpersonal relationships, and actually premature death. And we always recommend that don't try medication as your first option. There's a lot of behavioral options for improving sleep before you should consider medication. But getting adequate rest is good for brain health. Um, my last one is tease your brain more than your hair. Um, so what I mean by this is you should really be thinking differently, not harder. Everybody thinks I need to work harder to remember things. No, you need to be really thinking differently. Challenge your mind in novel and unique ways. Try to think outside of the box. Just a couple examples. Um, how many squares do you see up here? 16, no. 17, no. So there are the 16, there's the overall one, but then there are squares within squares. I think there's actually 26 squares up there. You think outside of the box, here's one, I guess this is the box, um, here's one way. All right, what three letters come next in this sequence? Oh, yes, ENT. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. ENT. So thinking out in different ways. A woman marries 11 men in the space of 10 years. She divorces none of them. None of them die. She commits no crime. How is this possible? She's a minister. All right, real, this, this is the most challenging one I got. Which sentence does not belong of these five? Why David? Because it doesn't make sense. And none of them make sense. No, David is not right. The last one, why? No, that's not correct. Well, I mean, it is a question, but that's not the correct answer. The one that doesn't belong is, badgers always smell sweet. Does anyone know why? Because if you take the first letter of every word, all the others spell birds, but that one spells a fish. Think about it. I'll put this slide back up later so you can catch your friends up. But I just wanted to say in conclusion that the aging brain, uh, aging affects the brain and its functions in a number of adverse ways. But these are not destined to you. There are many things that you can do to improve brain fitness. Even though I presented at least 15, they generally fall into three categories. Engage yourself physically, cognitively, and socially. If you want more information about what we do here at the university, here's our website, utahmemory.org. talks more about what we do and some other relevant research. But we are also involved in a class at um, Osher, and I know there are a lot of other classes out here that help you engage in many of the principles that I just talked about up here. Thank you very much for your attention.